Hey listeners, this is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today, I'm speaking with one of my intellectual heroes, Professor Philip Tedlock. His main research area has been the concept of good judgment and the impact of accountability on judgment and choice. He spent 35 years collecting forecasts from a wide range of people in order to figure out how good their predictions are and whose predictions are more reliable than others. His research is unusual for its depth and rigor, as it has now included tens of thousands of participants and millions of predictions, and it has a lot of relevant uh, conclusions that all of us can use in our day-to-day lives. I only had Philip for an hour for this episode, and I didn't want to waste the first 10 minutes having him describe his research in general, something that he's done many times before. For that reason, I'm now going to read an extract from the preface of the new second edition of Expert Political Judgment which outlines the five key findings of his research over the years, and then I'll briefly describe what he found in his later book, Super Forecasting. If you're already pretty familiar with Tetlock's work, I recommend skipping this section and going forward about seven minutes to the beginning of the interview. But if you've never heard of Tetlock and his research before, then I think listening to this first seven minutes will help make the interview make a whole lot more sense. So here's that slightly edited extract from Expert Political Judgment. The studies that provided the foundation for expert political judgment were forecasting tournaments held in the 80s and 90s, during which experts assessed the probabilities of a wide range of global events, from interstate violence to economic growth to leadership changes. By the end, there were nearly 30,000 predictions that were scored for accuracy using a rigorous system invented by and named for a statistically savvy meteorologist, Glenn Breyer. One gets better Breyer scores by assigning probabilities closer to reality over the long term, where reality takes on the value of 1, where the predicted event occurs, and 0, when it doesn't. Lower Breyer scores are therefore good. Indeed, a perfect score of 0 would indicate uncanny clairvoyance, an infallible knack for assigning probabilities of 1 to things that do happen, and of 0 to things that do not. The worst possible score, 2, indicates equally uncanny inverse clairvoyance, an infallible knack for getting everything wrong. An important comparison point is to think about the score that you would get if you relied on chimps throwing darts at a dartboard in order to make your forecasts. That is, if you chose probabilities at random. Dart throwing chimps would converge on a score of 0.5, the same maximum uncertainty judgment rational observers would make in guessing coin flips, which would earn chimps and humans alike the chance accuracy baseline of 0.5. The headline result of the tournament was the chimp soundbite, which is that experts were not that much better in their predictions than dart-throwing chimps. But expert political judgment central findings were much more nuanced. It's hard to condense them into fewer than five propositions, each a mouthful in itself, but I'll attempt to do that here. Overall, expert political judgment found overconfidence. Experts thought they knew more about the future than they did. The subjective probabilities that they attached to possible futures they deemed to be most likely exceeded by statistically and substantively significant margins, the objective frequency with which those features materialized. When experts judged events to be 100% slam dunks, those events occurred roughly 80% of the time, and events assigned an 80% probability materialized on average 65% of the time. Second, in aggregate, experts edged out the dart-throwing chimp, but their margins of victory were narrow. And surprisingly, they failed to beat sophisticated dilettantes, that is, experts making predictions outside their specialty, whom I labelled attentive readers of the New York Times. And they also lost to extrapolation algorithms, which mechanistically predicted that the future would be a continuation of the present. Experts' most decisive victory was over Berkeley undergraduates, who pulled off the improbable feat of doing worse than chance. But we shouldn't let terms like overall and in aggregate obscure key variations in performance, The third point is that experts surest of their biggest picture grasp of the deep drivers of history, the Isaiah Berlin-style hedgehogs, performed worse than their more diffident colleagues, or foxes, who stuck closer to the data at hand and saw merit in many clashing schools of thought. That differential was particularly pronounced for long-range forecasts inside experts' domains of expertise. The more remote the day of reckoning with reality, the freer the well-informed hedgehogs felt to embellish their theory-driven portraits of the future. And the more embellishments there were, the steeper the price they paid in eventual accuracy. Foxes seemed more attuned to how rapidly uncertainty compounds over time, and more resigned to the eventual appearance of inherently unpredictable events, black swans that would humble even the most formidable forecasters. 
The fourth point is that a tentative composite portrait of good judgment emerged, in which a blend of curiosity, open-mindedness, and unusual tolerance for dissonance were linked both to forecasting accuracy and to an awareness of the fragility of forecasting achievements. For instance, better forecasters were more aware of how much our analysis of the present depends on educated guesswork about alternative histories, about what would have happened if we'd gone down one policy path rather than another. Their awareness translated into openness to ideologically discomforting counterfactuals. So, better forecasters among liberals were more open to the possibility that the policies of the second Carter administration could have prolonged the Cold War, whereas better forecasters among conservatives were more open to the possibility that the Cold War could have ended just as swiftly under Carter as it did under Reagan. Greater open-mindedness also protected foxier forecasters from the more virulent strains of cognitive bias that handicapped hedgehogs in recalling their inaccurate forecasts, so-called hindsight bias, and in updating their beliefs in response to failed predictions, that is, cognitive conservatism. The fifth and final point is to beware of sweeping generalizations. Hedgehogs were not always the worst forecasters, tempting though it is to mock their belief system defenses for their often too bold forecasts, like the claim that they were off on timing, that is to say that the outcome that was predicted hadn't happened yet, but it would in future, or the close call counterfactual, which is that the outcome that was predicted would have happened, but for a fluky exogenous shock. Some of these defenses proved quite defensible, and, though less opinionated, foxes were not always the best forecasters either. Some were so open to alternative scenarios that their probability estimates of exclusive and exhaustive sets of possible futures summed to well over 100%. Good judgment requires balancing opposite biases. Overconfidence and belief perseverance may be the more common errors in human judgment, but we set the stage for overcorrection if we focus solely on these errors and ignore the mirror image mistakes of underconfidence and excessive volatility. So those were the findings of Expert Political Judgment, which was released in 2005. Ten years later, Tetlock released the book Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction. That book both described the earlier work and new results from a forecasting tournament that they had been running over the last five to ten years with support from the intelligence community in the United States. They had opened the ability to make forecasts to anyone who signed up to an online forecasting tournament called the Good Judgment Project. They found that while people weren't terribly good at making predictions in general, there were a subset of people, super forecasters, who had what it took to regularly make reasonably good predictions about the future. They described their work identifying these super forecasters and then putting them into super forecasting teams. In those teams, uh, super forecasters would share information with one another and discuss ever better methods of making accurate forecasts. They found that aggregating judgments from a wide range of super forecasters was an excellent way to produce good forecasts. Indeed, they could produce better forecasts than members of the intelligence community who had access to a great deal of classified information. And by using these super forecasting teams, they managed to win the tournament. So you can read that book, Super Forecasting. It's a really excellent book. I've, I've actually read it uh, twice and I, and, I can, and I can strongly recommend it. It has a lot of uh, you know, practical advice that we can use every day in order to make better judgments in our lives. With that unusually long preface out of the way, uh, now I bring you Professor Philip Tetlock. (music) Professor Tetlock is the Annenberg University Professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He's also co-principal investigator of the Good Judgment Project, a multi-year study of the feasibility of improving the accuracy of probability judgments of high-stakes real-world events. He's written 200 articles in peer-reviewed journals and several books, including Super Forecasting, The Art and Science of Prediction, Expert Political Judgment, How Good Is It and How Can We Know, Unmasking the West, What If Scenarios That Rewrite World History, and Counterfactual Thought Experiments in World Politics. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Philip. My pleasure. So we plan to talk about how people can conduct really valuable social science uh, research and perhaps even build on on your own uh, work. But first, um, you have a new crowdsourcing tournament going on now, don't you? Could Hybrid Mind? Well, I wouldn't claim that it belongs to me. It belongs to IARPA, the um, Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity, which is the same operation in the U.S. intelligence community that ran the earlier forecasting tournament. Um, But the new one is called Hybrid Forecasting Competition, and um, it, I think, represents a very important new development uh, in forecasting technology. Uh, It pits uh, humans against machines against human-machine hybrids. And uh, they're looking actively for human volunteers. So hybridforecasting.com is the place to go if you want to volunteer. Yeah, I I just signed up a a couple of hours ago. 
Uh, how is it different from the um, Good Judgment Project's open, open tournament? Much more emphasis on statistical and artificial intelligence tools uh, for aggregating forecasting cues and combining them in what the competitors hope will be optimal ways. Right. So you're going to take uh, judgments that people su- submit as humans and then try to combine them with judgments from kind of statistical processes and then try to produce a combination of the two that's better than either one? Well, there will be different competitors, uh, and the different competitors have different ideas about what, what what's optimal. And uh, the, pe- uh, the people who volunteer will be randomly assigned to one of those forecasting competitors, much the same way that uh, people were assigned uh, last time. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and and what are you hoping to to learn that's to learn that's different? Well, there are a lot of unknowns. Um, it, it, it it may seem obvious uh, that um, that machines will have an advantage uh, when you're dealing with um, complex quantitative problems. Um, it would be very hard for humans to do better than machines when you're trying to forecast, say. Um, patterns of economic growth in OECD countries, where you have very rich, pre-quantified time series, cross-sectional data sets, big correlation matrices, um, lots of macro models. Uh, It's hard to imagine people doing much better than that. Um, But it's not impossible because uh, the the models often overfit. And um, insofar as the better forecasters are aware uh, of turbulence on the horizon and appropriately adjust their forecasts, uh, they, they, they could even have an advantage on turf where we might assume machines would be able to do better. Um, so there's a domain, I think, of questions where there's kind of a presumption uh, among many people who observe these things that the machines have an advantage. Then there are questions where people sort of scratch their heads and say, how could machines possibly do questions like this? And and here they have in mind the sorts of questions that were posed, uh, many of the questions that were posed anyway, on the earlier IARPA forecasting tournament, the one that led to the discovery of super forecasters. Um, and you know, these are these are really hard questions about how how long is the Syrian civil war going to last? We, you know, when, when in twenty twelve is, is Assad going to last another six months or another twelve months, or or when they um, when the Swiss and French medical authorities uh, do an autopsy on Yasser Arafat, uh, will they discover polonium? Uh, <laughs> it's hard it's hard to imagine. Um, <laughs> Machines getting a lot of traction on many of these quite idiosyncratic, context-specific questions where it's very difficult to conjure up any kind of meaningful statistical base rates. Um, although when I say it's hard to construct those things, it doesn't mean it's impossible. <laughs> yeah. So I've been using the the, the Good Judgment. I've, I've been in the tournament for the Good Judgment Project uh, for the last few years. Um, I found it pretty hard to make uh, good judgments or to um, – to find ways to improve the the numbers that are that are already on there, because uh, typically they're, they're they're just pretty reasonable as far as I can tell. And also, for example, we, we, I was looking at the Chilean election today to try to figure out who was going to become president. I just don't know a whole lot about the, the Chilean election, so you throw <laughs> you throw some difficult ones at us. Um, but but when you take those numbers that that people like me are putting in there, how much processing do you do afterwards? Are we referring back to the earlier forecasting tournament from yeah. 2011 and 2015? Um, there's 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 quite a bit of statistical razzmatazz going on. Um, although it turned out that the um, the winning algorithm was 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 pretty pretty simple. Um, although if, if you don't if you're not comfortable with logarithms, it might be a little bit perplexing. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, it was it, the, the the core idea behind the algorithm was you know you you would take a, a, a weighted average. Uh, the most recent forecasts of the best forecasters. And then insofar as those forecasters are quite different from each other, you would do something called extremizing. Mm. Uh, now, so that's the argument for cognitive diversity. If you have a number of different people reaching the same conclusion via different inferential pathways, you should have more confidence in that conclusion than if they're reaching it through the, if they're all clones of each other. Uh, and the example I used in the super forecasting book was the example from um, uh, the advisors to President Obama uh, when he was making a decision about whether to launch the, um, the Navy SEALs at um, uh, a large house in the Pakistani uh, city of Abbottabad. Um, and 
the, the, the thought experiment runs like this, that if when the president went around the room and he asked his advisors, how likely is Osama to be in this compound, a mystery compound, if each advisor had said 0.7, uh, uh, what, what, what probability should the president conclude is the correct probability? And m most people sort of look at you and say, well, it's kind of obvious. The answer is 0.7. But the answer is only obvious if, if, if the advisors are clones of each other. If the advisors all share the same information and are reaching the same conclusion from the same, informa same information, uh, the answer is probably very close to 0.7. Um, but imagine that one of the advisors reaches the 0.7 conclusion because she has access to satellite intelligence. Another reaches that conclusion because he has access to human intelligence. Another one reaches that conclusion because of code breaking and so forth. So if the advisors are reaching the same conclusion, 0.7, but are basing it on quite different data sets processed in different ways, um, you're, what's the probability now? Most people have the intuition that the probability should be more extreme than 0.7. Uh, and the question then becomes how much more extreme, and that's where the statistical razzmatazz comes in, where you want to extremize and you want to extremize the, the, the weighted average of the most recent forecast of the best forecasters. You want to extremize that um, in proportion to the diversity of the uh, viewpoints of, uh, within, among the forecasters who are being aggregated. That's, that's, kind of a, that's kind of a long answer, but does that, that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it, it makes complete sense. It's, it's quite interesting because um, within the Center for Effective Altruism, where I've been working the last few years, uh, we often get people to independently come up with probability estimates for different things before we discuss something and, and, then, and then after we discuss it. Um, and, but we've never done this thing of then combining them and then saying, well, if we're all on one side, then that should make us even more confident than the average of our answers. Uh, but perhaps, perhaps we shouldn't anyway, because uh, we're all clones of one another or something like that, or we all have access to too similar information. But uh, that's maybe something we should consider doing. Well, well-functioning groups that 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 are that are very good at overcoming um, you know, biases, like uh, failing to share distinctive information. Groups that are effective at that, you you want to be careful about extremizing. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, it wasn't a good idea to to extremize the judgments of super forecasting teams because they'd spoken to one another too much. They were, in effect, self-extremizing. Interesting. Okay, so they were already adjusting for this. Well, I, I think when you, you when you applied those statistical tools to the, to that situation, uh, the result was worse yeah. <laughs> than you would have otherwise got. Nice. Um, so, if people want to participate in the in the latest forecasting tournament and see if they can they can be forecasters themselves and and just contribute to your research, I think they can they can sign up at uh, I believe it was hybridforecasting.com. That's correct. And yep. then you can start you can start making forecasts about all kinds of events, including nuke, uh, North Korea's nukes and uh, elections around the world, and uh, yeah, wars when they'll start and when they'll end. It's uh, it's it's I, pretty it's pretty fun if you're into that. I, I, it's it's going to be a huge challenge, and you and you and you won't just be competing against human beings; you'll be competing against artificial forms of intelligence. Right. Uh, who, who who are you backing? <laughs> well, you know, we started to talk about that at the beginning, right? The, the pros and cons, and you, 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 you can make a good case that the machines are going to have an advantage on the, 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 the one, one, one set of problems, and you can make a good case the machines will have a very hard time getting any traction mm. on another set, like the Yasser Arafat uh, autopsy problems, or very, very idiosyncratic problems. Um, I mean, but then there are things in the, that, that are sort of in the middle that are hard to classify. And I, actually, I think most of life is in the middle of hard to classify. Yeah. So uh, let's talk for a little bit about your uh, the latest edition of your book, Expert Political Judgment. Um, it has a, a new preface. And does, does it have any other changes? Uh, no, that's 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 that's, that's 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 the core change. Yeah, right. Uh, so 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 I've read the new preface, and I could I could sense a little bit of frustration on your part because it's been <laughs> a bit of a ten years since the original version came out, and I, and I think you feel that you've been somewhat somewhat misunderstood. Uh, <laughs> and, and one of the one of the ways that you've been misunderstood uh, is as endorsing endorsing populism, the idea that you know we've had enough of experts, and experts didn't know that know that much anyway. Uh, they don't know more than more than random people. Uh, what, what what's actually going on there? Because because you did you did say something like that, but then perhaps it's been distorted <laughs> well um I, um I mean I was, I was always a big fan of monty python <laughs> and, and and john and john cleese i think john cleese is a but was a brilliant comedian he may still be a brilliant comedian um but uh the the, the john cleese michael go perspective that that um expert political judgment somehow justified not listening to expert opinion about the 
um, consequences of, of uh, Brexit uh, struck me as a as a da- somewhat dangerous, a da- dangerous misreading of mm. the book. It's not that I'm saying that the experts are going to be right, uh, but I would say completely ignoring them is dangerous. I mean, it's very hard to strike the right balance between justified skepticism of pseudo expertise. And there's a lot of pseudo expertise out there. And there's a lot of overclaiming by legitimate experts, even. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's justified skepticism is, is, is very appropriate, obviously. Uh, but then you have this kind of know nothingism, uh, mm-hmm. which you don't you don't want to blur over into that. So you have to strike some kind of balance between the two. And um, that's what the, that's what the preface is about in large measure. A complaint that you raise in in a bunch of your books is that, you know, pundits who get on television tend to be extremely overconfident because that's much more entertaining to listen to. And so I think they're they're almost worse than random because they're extremely confident about exciting things that they want to say that are kind of contrarian. Um, But there's also this criticism of intellectuals in general that they kind of become too obsessed with their own particular field. Um, and they end up with uh, potentially quite radical views just because they've studied only economics or that's, yeah, that's the only thing that they know and think about. Uh, do you think it's it's the case that academics could even be worse than just a random person off the street? Is, is there any any evidence that you found for that? Uh, I, I, do, I, have, I have, do not have evidence that um, PhD level academics are worse than the average person off the street. What we, what we do have evidence for is, is uh, something that, that Danny Kahneman called the attentive reader of the New York Times hypothesis. And he, yeah. he coined that phrase when this research was in a very early phase back in, in 1987, 88, when we were, when we were colleagues at Berkeley. Mm. And uh, what, what that means is um, you get a boost from, having, from, from being an attentive reader of the New York Times or the, or the Wall Street Journal, to be bipartisan here. <laughs> you, 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 get a, you get a boost from being an attentive reader of the news. From, so from moving from nothing – to being an attentive reader of the elite press, you know, the Economist, Financial Times, whatever, you know, the, the elite press, uh, you, there is a boost. But that boost is substantially greater than the boost you get moving from being an attentive reader of the elite press to, be, to having a Ph.D. in China studies. Uh, that's, that's so that you, you hit a point of diminishing marginal predictive returns for knowledge um, depressingly quickly if you're an academic. Um, and, and you haven't found that, that experts can be poorly calibrated, even even the hedgehogs. Well, the hedgehogs were certainly worse calibrated in, in, in the early work, especially for their longer range forecasts. Yes, that, 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 that's true. Yeah. Oh, another thing you say in the preface is that uh, experts' biggest victory was over a bunch of uh, Berkeley undergraduates uh, who managed to pull off the improbable feat of doing, uh, doing worse, than, worse than chance. Uh, what's, what's the deal there? <laughs> well, uh, they just didn't know what they were doing, <laughs> and, think, and, yeah. and they didn't. They did. They didn't know how little they did. They, they knew, so they, yeah. they, 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 they were they were they were overconfident in in, mm. in messy ways. I, I don't. I don't think it's possible to do systematically worse than chance for prolonged periods of time. Mm. Um, uh, so I, I, I wouldn't treat that as a. I think it's, it was a curious feature of, of the data back then. Uh, I imagine some people might listen to that and worry that uh, you know students at uh, you know these liberal universities are just getting stuck in an echo chamber uh, and you know forming very extreme views that that aren't too justified. And I know I know a bunch of people at, at Berkeley. Uh, I live in Berkeley myself. Uh, should, should should they worry about that, or do you think undergraduates around the world are just uh, overconfident? Full stop. Yeah. Well, I worked at Berkeley for many years. Mm. Um, it was, you know, the, I, I spent more of my academic career at Berkeley than any other any other university, um, and that's going to remain true even if I stay at Penn for until I'm seventy five. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, the the, the, the Kassanstein echo chamber hypothesis. Uh, I, I think there is something to worry about there. Yes, mm. I, 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 I worry about campus intolerance. Um, I worry about echo chambers. Uh, I think our, our, our data are fairly clear on, on the benefits of cognitive diversity and forecasting. And I, I use the term cognitive diversity so I, we don't conflate it with you know the way diversity is used in, in, the, in the, um, the more political legal sphere. Do, do you have any evidence about how much that kind of uh, demographic diversity, like across ethnic or gender lines, uh, does does that match up with you know cognitive diversity? I, I suspect it does to some degree. Um, it, it's an empirical question. Uh, you know, we don't we're not in a great position to answer that question because the people who vol- volunteer for these forecasting tournaments tend to be quite disproportionately male mm. uh, and well educated. Uh, and um, having a somewhat of a quantitative inclination. Mm. So 
a bit of the Silicon Valley personality <laughs> profile here. <I've laughs> yeah, so maybe you could improve the or, forecast by by trying to spread out from that demographic group. I, I guess that they would also like uh, yeah cognitive. Well, that that would like um, you know diversity of knowledge potentially. Um, it's it's going to hinge a lot on on the match between the, the forecasters' predispositions and knowledge base and the types of questions you're asking. I think. Um, Although in, in, in early forecasting tournaments, they really did strive to ask an extremely heterogeneous array of questions. It, it was as though the, uh, what IARPA was looking for, the forecasting equivalent of, of general intelligence. Uh, so what other ways do you think, uh, you, have you found that your work has been misinterpreted that, that frustrate you? Well, I, th I, th I think the, the biggest one is, is the one you've already touched on. It's, it's this um, the populist know nothing uh, know nothingism, uh, which I, I think is dangerous for democracy. It's, da it's dangerous for our, the well well being of our society. Um, it, it, it is true that that there is a lot of ex expert overclaiming, so it's understandable that some very smart people have veered in, the in, a, in, a, in a know nothing direction. Um, but it's, it strikes me as very much an overreaction. Um, and if we, if, if, if we, if only, <laughs> I mean, the, what I always have hoped for is, is that um, more, more major institutions would take forecasting tournaments seriously. Um, so we could, um, we could develop some kind of institutional track record who, 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 who tends to be more accurate about what. Hmm. Uh, and uh, it, it, it would be more difficult, I think, for people like Michael Gove to dismiss um, skeptics of Brexit, uh, opponents of Brexit, if those opponents of Brexit had pretty good track records. Yeah, right. So what should uh, just a typical person do if they hear experts opining about Something that something that they know uh, more about than than the listener does. Should, should they kind of go somewhere between common sense and their judgment and, and what the expert is saying? These these are really hard questions, um, and I, I, I draw a distinction in the in the um, in the new preface to this the second edition between domains um, in which um, expertise is more likely to have really strong. Should should receive more deference than in other domains, mm. and the domains in which expertise should receive the, the, the most deference are the domains in which experts get quick, clear feedback on the accuracy of their judgments. Um, so people get quick, clear feedback on the accuracy of their judgments. Uh, well, to take an extreme case, if you're an expert poker player, <laughs> or if you're an expert chess player, uh, but there are many other domains of life where people get pretty quick, quick, clear feedback as well. Um, you, 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 you know, all, all other things being, being equal, you want to have a surgeon who's done the procedure a thousand times, not 10 times. All other things being equal, you want to have a pilot who's had a lot of experience and so forth. So, so, you know, even the most devout know nothings, I suspect, <laughs> when it comes to picking a pilot or picking a surgeon are, are, are willing to concede that there is genuine expertise. Um, the, the bulk of the criticism, I think, has been aimed at political and economic experts who are making judgments about complex macro trends. Uh, and nobody knows for sure uh, how close the world came to other possible worlds. So we don't we don't know whether, um, uh, you know, it, it, depending on how we, we don't know how Brexit's going to work out. Mm -hmm. uh, but if the economy does substantially better than the people were worrying, you know, there's going to be an argument, well, it would have done much better still. If, if, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, and you, you, can, you see that kind of argument for even in seemingly pretty clear cut cases of, 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 of pretty egregious errors, like, um, say, the Bush administration decision to go to war, w, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq in 2003. There are relatively few defenders of that decision who look back with historical hindsight at all and all, all the different, <laughs> at, the, at the bloody sequel sequelae of, of the of the Iraq war um, and and say boy that was a really good decision to go in there. <laughs> even you know but they say well you know, Saddam Hussein was a monster they say this is so bad though <laughs> yeah yeah uh, we, we wouldn't we have been better sticking with the, the monster we knew rather than than ISIS, um, I guess. Then, well, it, it, et cetera, all, yeah. all, all of the things that happened from between 2003 and, and 2017, the, the, the massive casualties in, 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 in both Iraq and, and Syria. Yeah. Um, how unevenly distributed is forecasting ability while, while we're discussing elitism? Um, uh, how, how many people uh, does it take to, to be as good as a single super forecaster? Well... <laughs> That's a tough one. Yeah. Uh, I, no, I, I no number you've calculated. I, well, it, 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 we, I, I, I'm sure there are people who are better at the internal data analysis than I am who could give you 
a, 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 a more confident answer, but I, it, it's it's somewhere between ten and thirty-five or so. I would say. Oh wow! Oh, wow. Um, okay, so it's a lot. Uh, it, it's quite a, it's quite a few. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. But I, but I, I've got a fairly wide confidence band around that. Um, sure. Okay, so it sounds like it's, it sounds like it's quite useful to become a super forecaster. Uh, what what's kind of the best training that you're aware of for listeners if they want to want to get better at forecasting things? Oh, that's really easy. Practice, <laughs> practice, practice. Uh, same way you get to Carnegie Hall. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so they should sign up to the tournament and start making predictions. Sign up for tournaments. Yeah. Don't don't be embarrassed of being wrong. It's, mm. it's not so terrible to be wrong. Yeah. Um, what what about kind of calibration training? Is there anything that gets provided to businesses or governments or or the, or the super forecasters? Any uh, advice that you give them or processes they can go through to get even better, other than practicing? Uh, there's an active debate among researchers in the field about the degree to which calibration training generalizes. So if I, I can get you to be well calibrated in judging poker hands. Is that going to generalize to how well calibrated you are on the weather? Is that going to generalize to how well calibrated you are on the effects of rising interest rates? Um, so the, the, the effects of transfer of training are somewhat on the modest side. So you, really, you, you, want, you want to be really careful about this. Um, I, I, I would say, oh gosh, um, I, you really want to concentrate your training efforts in the things you care about. So if it's open, if it's uh, you know, if it's philanthropic activities, I, I, I think you want to make have have people make judgments on on projects that are quite mm -hmm. similar to that uh, to get to get to get the maximal benefit. Um, I'm not saying that transfer of training is zero, hmm. um, although some people do say that. Uh, I, I think it's too I think it's too extreme to say the transfer of training is zero, and I, I think the transfer of training is greater if people not only get practice at doing it, but if people understand what calibration is, hmm. and if people understand what resolution is, if people understand there's a degree of tension between calibration and resolution in many situations. Um, the deeper an understanding people have of the metrics, how the metrics work, what it means to metricize one's judgment, um, I think the greater the transfer of training you're going to get. I, I, I think that's one of the benefits of being a super forecaster is that they um, – they, they, they really did develop a fairly nuanced understanding of how um, the subjective probability metrics work. Um, so are you, a, are you a super forecaster yourself? No, I can tell you a story about that. Um, I, 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 I actually thought I, 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 would, I could be, I would be. Uh, so in the second year of the forecasting tournament, um, by which time I should have known enough to know this was a bad idea, uh, I decided I would I would I would enter into the forecasting competition and make my own make my own forecasts. Yeah. Um, and if I had simply done what the research literature tells me would, would have been the right thing, and look at the best algorithm that you know, distills the most recent forecasts or the best forecasts and then extremizes it as a function of the diversity of the views within, if I had simply followed that, I would have been the the second best forecaster out of all the super forecasters. I would have been like a super, super forecaster. Yeah. <laughs> However, I insisted. Uh, now, what I did is I struck a kind of a compromise. I didn't have all the time, as much time as I needed to research all the questions. So I deferred to the algorithms with moderate frequency. But I often tweaked them. I often said, you know, they're not right about that. I'm going to tweak this here. I tweak this here. And the net effect of all my tweaking efforts was to move me from being in second place, which was <laughs> what I would have been if I'd mindlessly adopted the algorithmic prediction yeah. to about 35th place so that was <laughs> I, I fell 33 30, 33 positions by virtue of the cognitive effort i devoted there uh which i, I so I, I think there's a bit of a morality tale um, mm. so it's a little there. bit like like the active traders versus the index fund it is it is it is, it is a quite, quite a good parallel mm. Um, so in trying to become a better forecaster, um, are there any heuristics that you've, that you've adopted or any practices that you've adopted that have been, that have been helpful from your own work? Oh, he's, yeah. I mean, I've learned a lot from the super forecasters. I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful to have research subjects who are your teachers. And the, and the super forecasters have in many ways been my teachers. I, I've had the privilege of watching their debates go on over the years. And it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's deeply informative. Um, what, what, what have I learned from the super forecast? What do I do different? I'm not going to say I, I, most of the things they do I was aware of as being best practice. Um, but there were certain ways of doing things that I didn't quite get. 
And I, I, I appreciate them more now that I've seen the super forecasters in action up close across a variety of problems. And one is this technique that in the, in the book, Super Forecasting, I, I name it after Enrico Fermi. I call it Fermiizing. Um, it's, it's the tendency to um, take problems and decompose them into their unknowns. Uh, that's a very useful heuristic, especially for these really weird problems like um, – well, uh, yes, or Arafat's remains <laughs> score positive or polonium <laughs> in, the, uh, Swiss, in, in either the Swiss or the French autopsies. Um, and, and watching the way the super forecasters took a question like that that initially looks really just like a hopeless head, head scratcher and turned it into something semi-tractable. That, that, was a, that was an interesting thing to behold. And, you know, and, and that ties into another thing they do, which is they, they – they, they, they look for well, – when Kahneman draws a distinction between the inside and the outside view approaches to forecasting. And the super forecasters are much more likely than regular mortals to look at uh, things from the standpoint of the outside view. Mm-hmm. Uh, right? So if they're at a wedding, you know, they're more likely to say, you know, what's the divorce rate for this sociodemographic group? When they're asked how likely is the couple to get divorced, you know, a they're not going to be that offended. They're going to say, "Yeah, it's a real probability," <laughs> and it's probability, is, you know, maybe it's twenty-five percent, maybe it's thirty-five percent, depending on the sociodemographics. Mm. Um, they're not going to say something like, "Well, look how how in love they seem to be, and how happy everybody seems." Seems to be, uh, it's outrageous to imagine them getting divorced. Ninety-five percent they're going to stay married. If you start a probability because you get sucked up into the atmospherics and the enthusiasm of the moment, you're, you start off around ninety-five percent. It's going to take you a long time to adjust that probability so you're in the ballpark of plausibility. Much better if you start your plausibility estimates around something that's plausible. So in the Asser Arafat situation, you could you would ask a question. You say, well, what's what 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 statistical comparison classes are there for you know the uh, this sort of weird autopsy of a, of a leader of a, 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 a former terrorist organization. And, and you'd say, well, you could ask the question, when major medical and political legal authorities believe there are reasonable grounds for suspecting an autopsy is needed, hmm. uh, how often does the autopsy reveal hmm. <laughs> something uh, that was not, not had not previously been revealed? And it may, may, may indicate um, murder. Um, if you, if you, if you phrase it that way, you can actually make more headway. So there's a there's a very active debate in the effective altruism community at the moment about how much people should you know adopt the inside view versus the outside view, and how much they should just uh, defer to to mass opinion on, on important questions, or just defer to kind of the average view of a bunch of of a bunch of experts. Um, do, you, do you have any have any views on that? I mean, ob- obviously, the, the argument of uh, well, there's there's some people promoting a very radical view, basically that you should almost ig- ignore your own inside view and only look at the reported views of other people, or, or give you, give your own inside view no more weight than than anyone else's. Do you think that's a that's a good approach to having more accurate beliefs? Yeah, uh, I, I've never been able to impose that kind. Of- Kind of monastic discipline on myself, um, and the, the division between the inside and the outside view is blurry on on close inspection. I mean, if you start off your 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 ba- with a base rate probability of divorce for the couple being thirty five percent, and then you you information comes in about quarrels or about this or about that, you're going to, you're going to move your probabilities up or down. Uh, and that's kind of inside view information, and that's proper belief updating. Uh, now. They're getting the mechanics of belief updating are very tricky, and there's the problem of both cognitive conservatism under adjusting your beliefs in response to new evidence, and also the problem of excess volatility over adjusting um, and spiking around too much. Uh, both of which can obviously degrade accuracy. Um, but so I, I don't. I think. A, a, a categorical prohibition on the inside view is is is, is way too extreme. Um, uh, but starting off with your first guess, with the, with with the most plausible outside views, is 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 a, is a pretty, pretty demonstrably sound practice. Yeah, so I kind of misspoke when I said uh, not allowing the inside view, but it's it's more the argument that the outside view that you should take is to look at the probability estimates of people who seem like they know about the area and say, well, the experts on average say that this happened, that this is 70% likely, uh, and, and, and take that perspective and say, uh, well, when the experts say it's 70% likely, in fact, it is 70% likely. So my reference class is based on the, on the opinion of experts and their probability judgments. And then you right. don't really, and then you don't try to kind of tinker with it and add, and add your own judgment. Uh, that, that, that's so one approach that you could take. 
Right. That's the, the mistake that I made in the second mm-hmm. year of the forecasting tournament, tinkering. If I, whereas if I just left well enough alone, I would have been a super, super forecaster. Right. Yeah. But, 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 but only by virtue of cheating, <laughs> looking at the, um, at the, 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 the algorithmic combinations of the best forecasters. Um, so, hmm, I don't, you know, so after my second year experience, you'd say, well, maybe Tetlock has converted to that view, right? <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there, there's merit in it. Um, you know, I worry, I don't know why, but I worry about it too. I, I, I have a, I have this feeling it, it goes too far. Um, but I'm hard pressed to give you any evidentiary basis for that. Mm. Um, I mean, you could imagine, I mean, the, the argument about index funds is if index funds become too common, no one will have incentives to doing the, to do the research anymore. And, and then the, and the markets will cease to be efficient. And then presumably it will become efficient for people. It'll be, the incentives will return again. So it'll kind of oscillate back and forth in a, in a kind of a unstable equilibrium um, between the, the, <clears throat> the, the professional traders and the index fund people. Mm. Uh, you, 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 uh, would, you, would you want to have a situation where you'd have auto, where, where the where the expert community felt it was getting automatic deference? Oh, gee, I, I, I well, it, I think we're so far removed from that anyway. I don't, I don't see it as an imminent problem, but it, it is interesting that there are thoughtful people inside um, the Center for Effective Altruism who take that strong a position. It's an interesting position. Um, it's one that I should be sympathetic to given what happened to me in the second year of the forecasting tournament. Mm. Um, but it's one that I'm wary of, uh, and I'm going to have to think hard about exactly why I'm wary of it, mm. but I am wary. Oh, how about you? Uh, well, I, I'm very sympathetic to it. I, I, I agree. It's extremely hard to actually impose that rigor on yourself to always just be thinking, well, my opinion is no more informative than the stated <laughs> views of any other person. So even though I'm in my head 24 seven, I'm not going to give any greater weight to my own perspective on things. Uh, yeah. very, very difficult to do. But my guess yeah. is if you were just trying to make accurate predictions about the future, then that would be a pretty good way to do it. Because um, like, in as much as you have an unusual contrarian view, it's true that you might be right, but most of the time you're wrong if most people don't agree with you and can't be convinced. But the, the, perhaps the, the, tricky, the, the tricky implementation question is, you know, who are the set of experts who you should be looking at? And there's some people who think that it's a very broad range of people and you should average <laughs> them all. And there's others who think it's only yeah. a small number of people. And in fact, it might be quite straightforward for me to become one of those ex- experts, become one of the top five people. And then we can average the views of me and four other people, which gives you a bit more room to, to yeah. skew the results based on your own opinion. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I think that's a really good point about what, what, what's the composition of the expert uh, pool from which we're at, um, on which we're doing aggregation operations. Um, I think the 2016 election was a cautionary tale about a couple of things. One is the the, um, the opinion bubbles that many academics and, uh, 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 live in. That, that, that it was quite unthinkable to them uh, that they, they, their, 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 their their acquaintances could be that radically unrepresentative. Um, and the other is just the perils of extremely. I mean, who, who, one of the one of the great poll aggregators, Sam Wang at Princeton, had a probability of uh, Hillary victory at around ninety five percent. Now Nate Silver, who comes out relatively well in this situation, where he comes to with a probability just before the election of around seventy percent. Mm. Um, now, if Nate had been extremizing, if he had been um, saying, look, all, virtually all the polls are pointing toward a Hillary victory. She even has a margin, and she has the relevant, she has, she has borderline margins of victory in, in, these, in, these, in these swing states. Um, if, 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 we, if, we, if we aggregate, if we take these different, different polls with different strengths and weaknesses and we aggregate them, um, you know, any, any given individual poll might have a 55 or 60% Hillary victory, but many 55 or 60% probabilities with, from polls of varying quality in varying places um, would tip you toward, you know, a Sam Wang kind of 95% extremizing mm. uh, judgment. Um, whereas he, he, he throttled back to 70%. He, he didn't go beyond 70%. And, and the reason was he had, I, I think it was an intuition that uh, there, there was a problem of correlated measurement error. Mm. Um, and, and that these things weren't as independent as you might, as you, as you might hope. And, and they, they, they didn't have the sort of independence that would justify strong extremizing. Mm. Uh, that they're therefore a throttle back. Um, and that, in fact, 
proved to be a pretty good judgment. Now, of course, that's an individual case. It's a very important case. Perhaps history would have unfolded somewhat differently if um, there had been a Nate Silver advising the Democratic campaign, but maybe not. Yeah. Uh, around that time, a lot of my friends were saying there's just no way, including some of my family were saying that there's there's no way that Trump can win. And I just said, the prediction markets say it's about 25%. So I'm just going to think it's 25%. Uh, I'm not going to not going to sleep easy. There's there's more there's more categories than uh, yes, no, and maybe. There's uh, there's all these gradations. So. Yeah, yeah, 20. Uh, so 20. Yeah, so it's it's perfectly conceivable to say we, we, we live in a 25% likely world right now, as opposed to the, the 70, 75% likely world. Right? Yeah, That's a very 25% reasonable thing. likely things happen all the time. Yeah. Some of my uh, friends say that I shouldn't be too public about my political views because, you know, by by saying what I believe now, it's going to make it more difficult for me to uh, update my beliefs in future because I've already publicly tied myself to the mask and I've said, you know, I think this candidate's good or that that candidate's uh, bad. Is that something that people should consider being being more circumspect? Yes. Um, so the, some of the classic work that Leon Festinger inspired with cognitive dissonance theory uh, bore on exactly the hypothesis you're advancing there, which is that public commitment tends to freeze attitudes into place. Mm. So it becomes more difficult to change attitudes that you publicly committed yourself to. Uh, it becomes more emotionally painful to change them. It also becomes more cognitively difficult because you, once you make a public commitment to a position, uh, the direction of thought tends to shift. So you you, the, the, you you spend more time thinking of reasons why how you could be right and other people could be wrong, uh, as opposed to um, thinking about plausible objections that reasonable critics could raise and that you might factor into your position. So the, we, we call the, 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 the latter the, the form of thinking, uh, the former form of thinking, which is what happens when people make public commitments, we call it defensive bolstering. You, you, the major function of thought is to generate reasons why you're right and other people are wrong, critics are wrong, as opposed to the more open-minded, preemptive self-criticism pattern of thinking that often occurs among more open-minded people prior to commitment, uh, where you 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 you, you, you scan the, the 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 universe for plausible critics and uh, plausible objections and try to factor them into your position. Mm -hmm. So you're right. Once you once you make a pub, once you take a strong public position. Um, once you become, uh, say, a, a Paul Krugman or uh, a, a Brett Stevens or, you know, when, when, once you really become identified with a, a worldview, um, it becomes very, very hard to uh, acknowledge that you might have been wrong about this or that. The whole credit benefit starts to crack. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. So, yes, there is a case to be made. I, I, I try when, when, I, when I teach to be very agnostic, and, and I, I want people from quite a wide range of political views to feel comfortable. Obviously, there are some political views that are so outrageous that <laughs> yeah. I, can't, I, I, I can't take seriously. But I, 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 try, I try to have an expansive conception of tolerance. When I teach, and I, 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 I think I think it's crucial. I, I think the quality of debate is better when um, my, my, my minority points of view feel free to be aired. So I think that's all all to the better. Um, I'm, I'm not an, uh, all, all that effective as a political advocate anyway. So uh, I, I think my, my my comparative advantage is going to be in advancing in the science of judgment and choice and science of forecasting um, in the remaining years of my career. It's not going to be, uh, you know, as a, an amateur politician. Are, are there any things that you'd prefer that we weren't able to predict where it would, it would actually be bad if we, if we knew more? Oh, you mean like when I'm going to die? Things okay. like that. <laughs> I'm thinking more on the geopolitical level. Uh, like, like what if, uh, I mean, it, would it be bad if countries could predict the behavior of, you know, other countries or ad other adversaries more accurately? Could that be more unstable? What an interesting question. Um, I think most intelligence agencies around the world work with the tacit assumption that they're better off if their probability judgments are more accurate. Um, is it possible that feeding accurate probability estimates to risk-seeking politicians could lead them to make bad decisions? Absolutely. Um, intelligence agencies don't make the decisions. They simply inform the decision makers. Uh, so I, I, I think I'm hard pressed to say that uh, accurate accuracy is a bad thing. Uh, but I certainly concede that it's easy to imagine situations in which um, feeding accurate probability judgments to decision makers who have uh, reckless utility functions uh, think things can blow up. Yeah, right. 
but because so then the question becomes then the question becomes do you want intelligence agencies to offer false probability if, if the intelligence agency thinks they're going to misinterpret the probabilities should the intelligence agencies be uh, retreating back into vague verbiage forecasts and say there's a distinct possibility and nobody quite understands what anybody's really said but yeah. they think they they think they've learned something but they haven't really learned anything um, I imagine there could be some downsides to having intelligence agencies uh, you know puppeteering politicians uh. Well, there's always a debate about whether you know intelligence agencies have gone too far yeah. in, in in influence. I mean, there's a the term is sometimes usurpation. Yeah. I mean, are they are they taking over the role of policymakers? Um, I think um, my, my impression is the intelligence agencies are very careful about avoiding that. Um, but I'm, I'm yeah. and I think much undoubtedly hinges on the bare, on the personal relationships that exist between top level intelligence agency executives and the senior policymakers they advise. Um, I suspect when they're sitting in private talking to each other that you know it becomes more difficult to figure out who's <laughs> <laughs> right. But I, 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 I but but in principle, there's a very clear legal statutory division of labor uh, between intelligence agencies and policymakers. Policy intelligence agencies are about you know just the facts, man. Yeah. So at eighty thousand hours, we're particularly interested in forecasting really extreme and and, and unlikely events, things that might be you know less than one percent likely to occur. And part of the reason is that um, we think that these issues are quite neglected and often not very well handled because people are so bad at predicting how likely they they are to be that something that is one percent likely, uh, you know, a, a typical person might think that it's only a one in a million chance. Uh, what what have you managed to learn, if anything, about uh, predicting these uh, you know quite unlikely events? Uh, are we are we less accurate at forecasting those? Have we managed to learn anything? That is one of the most difficult of all the questions you could have asked. <laughs> uh, is, is is how do you go about assessing uh, accuracy uh, in the, in the tails mm. in the tails of the probability distribution and and how fat are the tails of the probability distribution? Mm. Um, it's a Kind of argument that Nassim Taleb has has raised. You know, we do the, um, how how good are we at distinguishing events that are one percent likely from events that are point zero 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 one percent likely? Um, and um, uh, some some people claim they've been able to make a lot of money in financial markets because they uh, have a better appreciation of the fragility of the mainstream financial uh, models. Uh, which they say are, you know, rest too heavily on Gaussian premises, mm. normal curve, bell curve um, kinds of premises. So um, your question you're asking is how, how, how much have we learned about how accurate people can, if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, yeah. you're asking how, how, how much can we learn or have we learned about how accurate people are in that in the, in the tail region, say between 5% probability and 0.00005%. Yeah. Um, and uh, the short answer to that is that's very hard. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's very, it's very, it's very, uh, because you have to have such a large number of forecasts to even get a few you, things to happen. You do, you do. Now there are interesting things you can do uh, to assess the logical coherence of people's probability estimates of things like uh, a pandemic that kills 100 million people in the next three years, or a nuclear war that kills. A substantial number of people, um, although nuclear war may be edging up above the five percent probability zone uh, in, uh, in 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 some experts' minds uh, because of events in the Korean Peninsula. But, but yeah, that, that I, you can assess the logical coherence of people's estimates. So you can say, well, um, uh, you can get people's judgments of how likely events are within a six-month period or a one-year period or a two-year period or a four-year period. Um, and if people's judgments, um, and you can do this in a between subjects design, so different people are making judgments on different things, or you can do it in a, in a subtle repeated measures design where it's not obvious to people that their consistency is being checked. Um, but if, if, if people show a phenomenon known as temporal scope insensitivity, um, that's a worrisome sign that they don't know what they're talking about when it comes to making judgments of low probability events. And that, that temporal scope insensitivity would mean that you you think that events are just about as likely six months into the future as they are four years into the future or eight years into the future. Um, we, we saw some of that, for example, in the work we did in the ACE tournament with the Syrian civil war. There were, there were, there were um, occasions where people seemed to be making judgments that the likelihood of Assad falling in the next three months, six months, 12 months were more or less the same. Um, can't be right. 
given that it sounds like we don't have that many research findings here, maybe it would be good if, if we could just uh, put some questions to super forecasters who have been trained and shown to do well on the, you know, 50-50 or the, you know, 90% uh, likely to 10% likely range, and then see what they have to say about these tail events. And uh, they, they have a you know, better shot at having accurate judgment there than otherwise, but, but we'll never be sure. I think that's that's certainly one useful thing to do. I think another useful thing to do is to, sec to check the logical coherence mm. of their probability estimates. Are they showing, for example, temporal scope sensitivity or spatial scope sensitivity? You know, what's the likelihood of a flu epidemic in 10 Chinese provinces versus 20? Or, mm. you know, um, uh, so I think logical consistency checks, I think um, – some cautious empirical generalization from people who are good in one zone to people who are good in another zone is probably is um, warranted. And I think also there are techniques for uh, generating question clusters. So if you think that – so Graham Allison just came out with a book on the future of U.S.-China relations um, and looking for – and he, he's you know, using historical base rates of what he calls hegemonic transitions uh, in which you know, one great power seems to be being eclipsed or su superseded by another great power as China's power rises and U.S. power doesn't rise as fast. Um, the, the argument being that um, when you look at world history, hegemonic transitions are a particularly dangerous time for major wars. Mm -hmm. So if you were just to use that historical base rate, he, he suggests uh, – and he doesn't have a lot of confidence in the base rate, but he says it's, it's one, one, one of the few things we have. Um, it, he, he thinks the probability of war is probably a little, a little higher than 50 percent in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Um, which is disturbing, the thought that that, that, that two superpowers of, <laughs> could 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 go to war. That the, the cat, you know, the, the, you you move from casually you get get one of those you know exponential Talebian functions, right? With World War One to World War Two, the casualty level of World, World War Two, the most the bloodiest war ever was about fifty or sixty million. Now we're going to move up to five hundred or six hundred million. Um, you know, it, it's it's uh, un unthinkably bad. But so so you, you you take something like a scenario of that, of that sort, the hegemonic transition, the, the prospect of war, uh, you, you, a major U.S.-China war sometime by the mid 21st century, uh, or you take another big scenario like a fourth industrial revolution that's going to dislocate major labor markets by the mid 20th century, 21st century, um, and you ask what sorts of things would we expect to observe in the relatively near-term future if this longer-term future were likely to occur. And we populate our forecasting tournaments with clusters of questions that are designed to have some degree of diagnosticity vis-a-vis -vis the, um, um, the, the bigger thing that we're interested in predicting. Mm. Um, and I think you can do that for these very, lower probability events as well, uh, the likelihood of, um, I don't know, some kind of bird flu jumping across species in the next three or four years, what, what sorts of things do the biochemists and the epidemiologists tell us would, would need to occur and would we be likely to observe as early warning indicators if we were on that historical trajectory? Um, the, so the probability is, is you know, less than five in a thousand or five in a ten thousand or a hundred thousand. What sort of, you, you, could, you could ask about events that would have some diagnosticity vis-a-vis -vis that, 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 that target and you could assess um, how accurate people are as forecasters of that, and you could create a kind of early warning index, or, right. or for good, you know, good things, a early opportunity index. Do any of your tournaments have uh, forecasts on the probability of a war versus China? If, if it's actually twenty percent, then I might have to start making preparations. <laughs> well, it really hinges on what time frame you're 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 talking about. I mean, you know, Gra Graham Allison was talking about history on the on the on, the, on a very extended scale. Um, hegemonic transitions occur over the course of a century, often, and um, mm, okay. You know, uh, Ch Chinese GDP is approaching U.S. GDP. Chinese military power is still substantially under U.S. but growing fairly rapidly, mm. and. Um, yeah. These these are these are the, among the warning signs, and then then of course you have these kind of tinderbox or, or, or catalyst situations that could trigger a war, like like the Korean Peninsula or something in the South China Sea or whatnot. Yeah, I'm not sure that there would be much to prepare for anyway. I don't think there'd be anyone left to execute my will, so probably not worth writing. <laughs> um, Robin Hansen has proposed an entire model of government based on on prediction uh, markets called futarchy, where you you would elect a parliament to kind of choose what society what what outcome society wants, and then you would have people betting on these prediction markets to say how 
kind of the utility function of society as a whole would be would be affected positively or negatively by different policies that could be implemented. And then if the prediction market consistently says that implementing a policy would raise, you know, the social welfare function that the parliament has chosen, then that would make it become a law. What do you think of that? <laughs> um so I, I know Robin, and Robin was one of the people who was a participant in the earlier forecasting tournament, and we, we, we've experimented with prediction markets ourselves, and uh, we think they're powerful tools for improving accuracy. Um, we don't use prediction markets that much ourselves. We, we prefer uh, for, uh, forecasting tournaments and competitions among individuals and statistical algorithms applied to individual forecasts, and we believe that we can perform as well or better than forecasting tournaments using those tools. Um, I, I'm sure Robin has thought through these issues about uh, when, when, once you uh, have very high policy stakes hinging on either a prediction market or a forecasting tournament, you create incentives for people to try to skew the results. Mm. Um, I think I think his claim there is that, yes, you would have a big business that would come in and try to skew the results, and then other people would come along and try to take their money because they'll just be able to take the other yeah. side of the bet easily. Yeah. Right, right. Um, but then so, there's that 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 is it, uh, was it Keynes or Soros who said the market can stay irrational <laughs> longer than you can stay solvent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, and and they can also take advantage of the of the risk aversion on the other side of the bet uh, if they're a very if they have a lot of access to money. Um, yeah, uh, well, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that um, policymakers should be informed by. Um, thoughtful, probabilistic judgments distilled through the best known scientific methods. I, I think the world would be a better place if we proceeded along those lines. Um, and I think prediction, so I think Robin and I are fundamentally on the same same side. Uh, we just have slightly different approaches. Mm. Do you, given, the, given the value of good foresight to society as a whole, do you think it would be worth trying to create you know, a school, either either a high school or perhaps a, a university course, where the main goal is just to produce incredibly good uh, super forecasters, and kind of the entire the entire curriculum is focused around making them have have good judgment and learn what they need to know about forecasting. I think that's an excellent idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, yeah, I, I I've thought about how exciting that would be to to try to get that funded and uh, and up and running in the in the Bay Area. Unfortunately, I, I already have a job. But if anyone's listening and would like to start a high school focused around a, a super forecasting tournament, then uh, I get in touch and I'll see if I can help you. Well, do you know Stephen Coslin? I actually don't. Uh, he's the. Um... He's the, he's the he's the chief academic officer of Minerva. Okay. You know that univer yeah. that university that's based in the Bay Area. Yeah, I know some people from Minerva. Yeah, um, so, so that's and, a potential uh, hub for it. From what I've read about Steve, Stephen Coslin's work, uh, I, I think he would be quite sympathetic to that idea. Mm, okay, uh, I'll, I'll send him an email. And they so, have a, they have a very unusual curriculum. Yeah, I they, mean, they're, 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 yeah, they seem willing to be quite they, experimental. They they are mm. um, much more so than. Um, mainstream academic institutions where uh, to create a major in super forecasting would be a, uh, an, an academic career in itself. Yeah. If someone could produce, you know, a, a training course like, like that one that would allow people to uh, improve their judgment, wouldn't that just be of incredible value to, to hedge funds and people in the financial industry? Because that, they'd be able to make just, just a whole lot more money, you would think. And, and it kind of surprises me that this isn't a bigger business or that there aren't more people trying to, you know, start... Uh, for profits based on based on the research in your book super forecasting I think that that's a good point um, and there certainly has been a lot of interest in in the super forecasting project in the in the financial industry so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's been ignored by any means um, but we're in just in the very early stages right now of discovering what it's possible to teach and train by way of, uh, of improving forecasting. I mean, we, we did test in each of the four years of the IARPA tournament, the first generation tournament from 2011, 2015, we did test uh, training modules that produced uh, improvements in probabilistic accuracy between 8 and 12% each year in randomized control experiments. So that was a, I think that was an impressive demonstration. It's in the scientific literature now in um, at John Barron's journal, Judgment and Decision Making. Um, so we're that, that that I think was an important finding, but um, bear in mind that those, those training modules were developed in the context of a particular tournament uh, in which certain types of questions were being asked, and we needed to create a, a create, create performance engines 
we were we were looking for ways of winning it. We were, we were not only we were not only doing research; we were also trying to win a tournament at the same time. So uh, there there are advantages now now that we're in, not, not as actively engaged in tournaments at the moment. Uh, there are advantages to stepping back and designing these kinds of training systems and contouring them around the needs of, the, of, of specific cognitive niches. Um, and um, that's what, that's one of the things I think that um, we're, we're, we're doing right now. Um, at some point in the next decade or two, you're probably going to re- retire from, from active research on these questions. Um, what, what things do you worry you're going to leave un- unsolved that um, perhaps someone in the listening audience might be able to work on? My, one of my deepest hopes is, as I may lay out in the preface for the new expert political judgment, is that there will be a new generation of forecasting tournaments that focus not just on the accuracy of answers. I mean, everything in the first generation of forecasting tournaments is really about accurate answers. And uh, I think the questions were reasonably good, uh, but that w- it wasn't a major focus of the research to generate good questions. Mm. Um in fact, we don't even have a very clear understanding of what it means to generate good forecasting questions. We know what ac- forecasting accuracy means, being jump prior score minimization, and there, there, it's, it's a, or other proper scoring rules. There, there, are, there are very well-defined criteria for judging the accuracy of forecasting um, uh, judgments. But there aren't such well-defined criteria for judging how probative or insightful or creative forecasting questions are. Uh, what sorts of questions should we be asking about the Fourth Industrial Revolution or about um, China, uh, uh, Sino-American relations or the future of the Eurozone or um, the future of Islam? And, uh, what, what sorts of questions should we be asking about those those topics? Um, and, 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 way, and, and inserting them into forecasting tournaments in ways that advance the conversation, make the, make, make, make the larger um, societal conversation about those issues richer and deeper. Uh, so that requires bridging what I call rigor and relevance. The first generation tournaments were really strong on rigor and assessing probabilistic accuracy, but they weren't so strong on ensuring relevance to these issues that we all deeply care about. Uh, so it's, it's making the connection, it's bridging the rigor relevance divide. It, it's having questions that are simultaneously rigorous, but relevant to big, to big issues. And there's a tension between doing that, right? Because if you want to train people to become more accurate probabilistic judges, you want to ask questions that are going to come due every three or six months that are very specific and well-defined. Uh, you're not going to be asking questions about the atmospherics of U.S.-China relations. They're going to be asking questions about what happened in the South China Sea or what happened here or there. It's going to be very grounded. Uh, so developing methods of connecting uh, the very specific rigorous questions you need to give people clear feedback and learn how to get better, how to link those kinds of questions with these uh, larger questions that dominate policy debates. And I think one of the key tools for that is, I alluded to it briefly earlier, uh, question clustering, uh, developing questions, uh, clusters of questions about U.S.-China relations or Fourth Industrial Revolution that cumulatively, that each question in itself isn't a deal, a deal maker or a deal breaker. It doesn't, each question in itself doesn't tell you there's going to be a nuclear war between U.S. and China or, or that uh, the Kurzweilian scenario in 2045 is going to come to pass. But, but each one sheds a little bit of light on that, and each question sheds a different type of light. So that the questions are each question in the cluster has some degree of diagnostic relevance to the big theme, but the questions within the cluster are not highly correlated with each other. So you want items in within a cluster, questions within a cluster that are not tightly correlated with each other, but that are highly correlated with the big abstraction. So you want questions about if it's fourth industrial revolution, you want you want questions about uh, say uh, uh, driverless uh, Ubers or Lyfts picking people up in major U.S. cities by 2020. Or, uh, you want a question about um, AI systems winning world poker championship, multiplayer world poker championships. Uh, you want something about uh, robotic spending in the U.S. exceeding $200 billion by 2020. So you want a lot of questions, but you don't want them to be too overlapping with each other. You want each of them to be somewhat independent, but you want each of them also to be relevant to the same theme. So it's it's it's, it's steering that, that. So that's the art of generating probative question clusters that are that retain you, you keeping the rigor of a forecasting tournament but gaining more relevance by posing carefully selected question clusters mm. and that is really hard 
Um, we, we have been working on it, um, and other people have too. And, um, but it's, 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 a, it's a great challenge, and uh, I'm, I'm very much hoping that we will make progress on that uh, before I retire. It, it seems like uh, to pursue your, your dream of, of better, better judgment and predictions in government, there's kind of two different paths you could take. One would be to become a researcher like you, and another one would be to become an advocate, uh, either you know as a public intellectual or in the media, or, or perhaps within the government uh, itself. Would you would you like to see more advocates as, as well as more researchers? And w- which do you think is the greatest bottleneck? Um, and just just to demonstrate uh, like how, how controversial this issue can be, when we published our profile on um, improving decision making in government, uh, we opened with the story of the Iraq War and the, you know the estimates about uh, weapons of mass destruction, and quite a lot of people got back to us and said, "You're completely misunderstanding this. That wasn't about bad forecasting. It was about bad politics, and it wouldn't have mattered what the, what the intelligence services had said because they were just being bullied by by Dick Cheney." Um, I, I think that's that's not your view, but there's a whole lot of things to, to potentially talk about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it, it, it's it's certainly the case that intelligence agencies are sometimes ignored, and it, it's certainly the case that intelligence can be politicized. Um, put putting aside what, whatever might might have happened in Iraq uh, in two thousand three, um, I think most intelligence agencies around the world thought there was a better than even chance that Saddam was up to something suspicious. Mm-hmm. And Saddam, and, and we now know with his historical hindsight, was actually trying to create that impression because he didn't want to appear weak. Uh-huh. I just, he just uh, so um, didn't work it, out too well for him. No, it did. It, it didn't. It didn't work out too well for him. But it, it, it was it, it, um, virtually everybody thought it was something. But but no, the, the idea that it was a slam dunk or a hundred percent probability that there are weapons of mass destruction. I I, I think that was. Um, that was either an egregious intelligence error or it was some form of politicization. I, mean, I, 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 I don't know for sure what, what, what the actual truth of the matter is, but it's a serious problem either way. With respect yeah. to activism, um, yeah, I'm not, so I'm not temperamentally an activist. I'm, I'm temperamentally a researcher, and it's, it's, it's what, I, what, I, what, I, what I know how to do. Um, but I have been tempted you know, by some forms of quasi-activism. Uh, and one of them is a project I, I, I've, I've started on called the Alpha, Alpha Pundit Challenge, uh, which is an effort to take um, the commentary of, of leading pundits like uh, Tom Friedman or uh, Martin Wolf or, you know, a lot, very prominent people uh, in the UK, US, elsewhere, um, who, offer, who offer opinions on various subjects and often offer implicit forecasts as well. Uh, and to take those implicit for to to extract those implicit forecasts and uh, have intelligent readers go through them and impute probability ranges to them. Mm, okay. So Larry Summers in 2016 thought the probability of a uh, U.S. recession was one in three, mm. um, and the super forecasters happened to think it was 10 percent. Um, didn't happen. Now we don't know in, in any given case. We don't know who is right, mm. right? Because they're probable the probabilities and they're. Um, but cumulatively, you, you, if you over a number of judgments of this sort, we find that Larry Summers really was exaggerating the probability of a recession in 2015 or 16. You, that, that, will, that, that sort of thing will be picked up. Uh, now, insofar as pundits come to believe that there is some uh, reasonably well-connected and prominent monitoring agency that's <laughs> watching the, 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 the implicit forecast they're making, uh, you could make a case that they would become more circumspect and more thoughtful about what they claim uh, because they, they would fear that their credibility would wax or wane as a function of accuracy. Uh, right now, pundit credibility does not wane very much as a function of accuracy. Pundits have quite effectively mastered the art of um, appearing to go out on a limb without actually going out on a limb by using vague verbiage forecasts like there's an distinct possibility of this happening, which mm-hmm. readers will, will tell you could, could mean something about as low as 20% or could mean something as high as 75 or 80%, um, which, you know, keeps you very, you're very comfortably positioned on both sides of maybe, <laughs> no matter what happens, right? If Putin does invade the Baltics, you can say, ah, look. You'll always be vindicated. I, I told you a distinct possibility. And if he doesn't, said, I merely said it was possible. Yeah. So you're, you're always, you're, 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 you have this uh, kind of um, perpetual immunity from uh, falsification. Uh, so I think that is a deep problem, and um, it, 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 I, I think it needs an activist push. I think it needs an activist 
big institutional sponsor uh, that's prepared to push that agenda. It would be great if we could learn how to automate the text analysis, automate the prediction extraction, even automate the probability imputation. Although I think for probability imputation, you really do need to have panels of intelligent readers um, of different ideological persuasions reading it as a way of showing that the fix is not in, that it's, mm. that it's legit, legit. And blind them to who said it, presumably. Um, it, depending on the purpose, yes. Yeah, so that's a really interesting idea for activism. But uh, coming back to research, if, if someone wanted to be the, the next uh, Dr. Tetlock, um, what should they study uh, early on in their career and, and where would be the ideal place for them to study? Um, I, I don't think it would probably be where I came from, uh, which is from psychology. Um, it, it would be more likely to come from uh, public policy schools, from uh, either in business or independent public policy schools like like Kennedy or Wilson, um, or um, uh, I, I, perhaps economics. I thought that you might suggest, say statistics or potentially even computer science, uh, given if, given you're going in an AI direction now. Well, I'm not an AI researcher myself. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm studying predictions about AI, which is really, yeah. really quite a different thing. And I, hmm. I hope to be a consumer of AI techniques in, in some of the work I'm doing. Uh, but I'm not. I'm not actually generating those techniques myself. Um, I, I was thinking a, f a field that combines technical expertise with 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 substantive expertise, like economics, would be a more would be more likely. Uh, but it, it could be the right combination is is is, is uh, some social science AI combination. Uh, and are there any you know um, mentors or PhD supervisors or particular schools that you think would be great uh, for people to go to for for grad school? Uh, meaning if, 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 if their goal is, if they wanted to specialize what? in, in, you know, forecasting and, and accuracy and good judgment. That's a surprisingly difficult question. Hmm. Um, are there other people at, at UPenn who could be good to study with? Oh, there, there are many good people in many different places. It's not that I, I'm, not, I'm not thinking of anybody at all. It's just that I'm having too many competing associations. So right. I, I'm, I'm thinking uh, there are good people. There are uh, very good people, actually superb people, at, at all of the usual suspect places. Okay. Um, so, so you're not, you're not uh, short not, of choices. There, there, there's not a particular place that stands out and say, oh, you must go there uh, because that's where the future is happening. Um, I, I don't. I don't see that. Interesting. What about, uh, you know, if you're thinking about potentially doing, going to grad school to, to work on this kind of research, are there any, you know, conferences or internships or volunteering that people could do to, you know, build a professional network in the area and, and experiment with whether it's, it's the right thing for them to do long term? There, there, there are. Um, well, you know, they, 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 we, we, we certainly work with a lot of different people. Hmm. So that, that would be, we're, we're one, we're one place and people should feel free to, to write to me. Uh, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I'll be, because of the demands on my time, I'll have probably have to refer it to some segment of the, my, my, my collaboration network. You know, I'm very, very fond of a particular computer scientist here at Penn, uh, who I think is just marvelous. And he was the guy who invented the algorithm that was the winning algorithm in the ACE tournament that I was talking about earlier mm. that, that goes under the, the log odds extremizing label. Um, where, you know, like the Osama Obama story that I, <laughs> I, yeah, I told yeah. earlier. Um, and his name is Lyle Ungar. Uh, and he, he's he's um, he, he's a he's a he's a terrific mentor and a terrific human being, um, and he played a huge role in um, the success of the Good Judgment Project. Outside of uh, academic research, are there any organizations that you think would be really helpful to work for? I guess you know you've gotten quite a lot of funding through through IARPA, so I suppose it would be good to have supporters uh, continuing to work in <laughs> IARPA and the intelligence services. Uh, but is there anywhere else? Um, well, Open Philanthropy has been supportive of the work. Um, the Carnegie, Carnegie um, Corporation has been somewhat supportive of the work. Um, MacArthur has expressed some interest. Um, but uh, you, are you talking about institutions like the World Bank or yeah, so, uh, places so yeah, like that? So potential funders is certainly one. But I guess I was also wondering, are there any businesses that are doing cutting-edge research in, the, in this area? Well, my, 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 my friend Michael Mabasan, who is an adjunct professor of finance at Columbia, you've probably heard of him. Um, you know, he's um, – wherever he goes, <laughs> there's interesting activity on, on, on the intersection between judgment, choice, and finance. Um, he, has, he, has a, he has a really deep and visceral understanding of, um, of um, 
both the psychology of forecasting and the statistics of forecasting. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we often give advice to, to young people on how they can build up their skills in order to to advance their career. And I guess I guess one way you could build up your skills is to try to become a to try to become a forecaster. Do you know of any examples of you know these these random retirees or people who are just at home uh, you know in, in your tournaments becoming super forecasters and then getting hired by you know Goldman Sachs or the intelligence services to, to produce a good forecast for them? You'd probably be better asking Terry Murray, who is the former project manager of the Good Judgment Project and now the CEO of Good Judgment Incorporated, uh, which is another place, by the way, interns might want to consider going. Um, but Good, Good, Good Judgment Incorporated um, could be a good place to start. Is there any other advice in, in general that you'd like to give people who might want to you know, contribute to, to your research agenda in, in, in the future? Most people, I think, who are listening to this podcast are, you know, have have, are, have career tracks and lives that are in, there, there's an embeddedness, right? You're 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 on a certain track, um, and I, I I think you 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 want to be careful not to ask too much of people. And what I what I, well all I would say is it would be it's helpful if people read the news in a different way. Um, if they read the news from the standpoint of um, the principles of super forecasting, if they think about what are the implicit probabilistic claims that are in here, how are people trying to influence me, um, are the people who are making the claims playing a pure accuracy game? If they were playing a pure accuracy game, wouldn't they be more clear cut about what exactly they're claiming? The, the, the climate of political debate has deteriorated to such a degree that um, – I, I guess I'm an optimist. I, so I'm an enlightenment optimist. I, I, I believe that enlightenment values will ultimately triumph. I, I, I don't know why I still continue to believe that so much, but I, <laughs> but I, but, but, but I, I, I do. And it may, it may be irrational belief perseverance on my part, but I, I, I think that, um, that the current polarization, nasty polarization and politicization, um, and the name calling and so forth, um, and that, 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 that politicization will eventually die down and that, that, that people will, 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 will recognize the values of intellectual temperance and, and thoughtfulness. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's, always, it's, a, it's a tough sell. The, 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 idea, the ideals of super forecasting, are, I think, are a tough sell in any administration um, in, the, in the 20th century or nearly 21st century. Um, and it's become an even tougher sell now. Um, but... I, I, I do hold out this hope that the long that there's this long there's a, the, the long arc of history <laughs> yeah. is, is going to bend toward enlightenment values um, because there is such a, a deep competitive advantage to be had in doing that. But you're, you're getting me into a, a, a somewhat morose philosophical <laughs> mood here, Rob. <laughs> I, I'm not sure um, when you say that. Uh, People will produce more accurate forecasts, and politics will be better. Whether that's a prediction or or just more of a dream, but uh, well, well, institutions institutions that generate more accurate the institutions that are guided by more realistic probability estimates, that the consequences of their policy options will, on average, do better over the long term. Mm-hmm. I think that's a fairly uncontroversial point. Um, well, uh, it's it's been uh, fantastic to talk to you. You're a very very busy guy, and I've taken up quite a lot of your time. So uh, so I should let you go. But uh, thanks thanks so much for making time for the eighty thousand hours podcast. Well, it's, it's a real pleasure talking with you. I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the goals of um, effective altruism, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm always glad to talk with you guys. Great. All right. Well, uh, maybe we can talk again about, about future findings in your research. Um, yes, I think we should do that. This has been a very enjoyable conversation. Fantastic. Have a great day. Take, okay, bye. As always, I hope you enjoyed that episode. We're going to take a break from the podcast for a couple of weeks while 80,000 Hours is working on its annual review. But I have a number of great interviews already recorded, including ones with Professor Will McCaskill about moral philosophy and the effective altruism community, Jan Leiker from DeepMind about advances in artificial intelligence, Anders Sandberg from the Future of Humanity Institute about colonizing space, and Michelle Hutchinson about how to set up a new academic institute. So we'll be back in December with plenty of new interesting content. Remember, if you'd like to try improving your forecasting ability, then you can sign up for the latest forecasting tournament at hybridforecasting.com, and you'll be helping to advance the the research that Tetlock is working on. And if you're at all interested in doing similar work to that which Tetlock has been doing for the last 35 to 40 years, or are keen to find some other very valuable social science research to work on, then you should definitely get in touch with us to receive free personalized coaching. You can apply for that with the link in the show notes or the associated blog post. We know a lot of people in this area, 
and can offer plenty of guidance to help you advance your career more quickly. Thanks so much. Talk to you in a couple of weeks.